University of Iowa. Go Hawks! And a PhD <laughs> at the University of Texas at Austin. She, she, her research examines elements of racial identity and the process of hate in interpersonal relationships. Amr serves as the assistant professor in the psychology department at Hawaii Pacific University. Her student says she doesn't conform to traditional gender roles, is busy, is a vegetarian, is surprisingly patient, is bossy, can handle four days of labor, and is not racist. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, they say the work we do challenges traditional conception of social groups, and she forces us to think critically, even outside the lab. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Catherine Amer in reviewing the findings of Academically Adrift. We are, where are we going? Can you hear me? Yes, I feel like, okay. So I'm going to be reviewing the book Academically Adrift, uh, Learning on College Campuses by Richard Aram and Josiah Orozco. My title talk is Academically Adrift, Where Are We Going? So first, the book is really about the CLA, or the College Learning Exam. So you might be wondering why I call a book Academically Adrift is really just about uh, the college learning exam. And my first reaction was, probably because no one would buy a book on the college learning exam. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, with you. It's, it's not something you probably want to buy a book on. But if you do uh, frame it within as a benchmark as college failure, or at least students not learning enough in college, people are much more likely to buy the book. So an overview, or at least like, the general gist of the book is, is that when you're an incoming freshman, so let's say you think of yourself here as an average intelligence student over here in the normal distribution, right? You've got that group average right here. Thanks. Awesome. Um, then you come in as a freshman and you're average. You would expect that over time you would actually become over here when you graduated, right? You would like become super smart. You would leave the school feeling much more informed and like a smarter person, correct? <laughs> right? That's what we would think. Do we actually end up doing that? Is that what actually happens? And the book is saying, no, not really. So the book has three main arguments that I want to go over for you. Uh, so first, is that universities and employers value critical thinking. That's their big push. And they see it numerous times. In a rapidly changing economy and society, there is widespread agreement that these individual capacities, critical thinking and complex reasoning, are the foundation for effective democratic citizenship and economic productivity. And it goes on seeing numerous times how much people really value critical thinking. Critical thinking, critical thinking. The last one being employers overwhelmingly report value employees who exhibit strong critical thinking and written communication skills. That's a big one. Their second argument is that, OK, great, so we all value critical thinking. But second year education or high school education and post-secondary universities are not preparing students to be critical thinkers. So although we value critical thinking, they say we do, we are not preparing our students to be critical thinkers. Okay? And then the last argument, which I thought was a little subversive throughout the whole text, and people might disagree with me, and at any time if you feel like you're disagreeing with me, you should say something and then maybe I'll respond. <laughs> <laughs> By using our testing product, the CLA, you will be better able to discover if your school is meeting required critical thinking assessment goals. I really felt like throughout the whole text, and this was just for me, that it's really kind of selling the CLA, like I should be using it, like I should be using it every day in my class. Never mind my not using it. I felt guilty for not using it after a while. And then I was like, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be reading about the CLA, but I ended up, that's what it was. Mm. So I'll talk about this later. First, um, do schools and employers really value critical thinking? So I actually, although they pushed it and they tried to prove it a little bit, I really thought to myself, do employers and universities actually value critical thinking? Do we? So I just happened to look up um, the first uh, top three schools ranked by US News in 2016. You can use any benchmark, but you shouldn't be surprised the top three universities are Ivy League, and that was Princeton, Harvard, and Yale. I then went and I actually looked at their mission statements because I wanted to find out, do they really value critical thinking? Does like Harvard really push critical thinking onto their students? So I looked and I found out their, their mission statements. I just look at their university mission statements. I also looked at their general colleges as well. And I found out 
they don't mention critical thinking anywhere in their mission, mission statements at all. So here what we have like Princeton, a commitment to innovation, free inquiry, and the discovery of new knowledge and new ideas, coupled with a commitment to preserve and transmit the intellectual, artistic, and cultural heritage of the past. Sounds like a great school to go to. I don't really see much mention of critical thinking, although that's kind of implied in some ways. And then there's Harvard. Uh, the mission of Harvard is to educate the citizens and citizen leaders for our society. That sounds like a great school, too. Um, and then there's Yale. And it's to seek exceptionally promising students of all backgrounds from across the nation, around the world, and to educate them through mental discipline, social experience, to develop them inter their intellectual, moral, civic, and creative capacities to the fullest. These all sound like great schools, but there's not much mention of critical thinking, if you notice. Which I found interesting that the Ivy League schools aren't actually explicitly mentioning critical thinking, but they actually produce, you later on find out, the greatest critical thinkers. Then, so what I did is I Googled, okay, critical thinking in college mission statements. And I found, I did find some evidence for that. And you'll see that at UNR, for example, the University of Nevada, Reno, they actually put that specifically in their mission statement. The college provides students with the knowledge, critical thinking skills, and creative experience they need to navigate in a complex global environment. Then there is Southwestern College, prepares students for careers and for graduate studies with courses that foster critical thinking and effective communication. And then at Baruch College, faculty cultivates its students' analytical ability, critical thinking, cultural awareness, and ethical sensibility. So there are some schools that seem to emphasize critical thinking, but they aren't certainly the top schools. Okay? My next big question was, do employers really value critical thinking? And this was much more interesting to me, because there seemed to be much more of a push for employers valuing critical thinking than for the universities. And so I looked at Fortune Magazine, I looked for the top three places to work at. If you didn't know, that happens to be Google, Acuity Interest, and Boston Consulting Group. Those really nice places to work, and a lot of employees say they really love working there. And if you haven't checked out Google already, it's a great, really is an excellent place to work. Sorry, I really like that place. So let's look at Google. When I go there, I try to apply for a job at Google, not that I actually apply, but I looked. Oh, that'd be great if they hired me. <laughs> uh, so Google, how do you think? They're really interested in this. We're less concerned about grades and transcripts and more interested in how you think. We're likely to ask you some role-related questions that provide insight into how you solve your prob uh, solve, solve problems, not just your problems, with problems. Um, they show us how you tackle the problem presented. Don't get hung up on nailing the right answer. So there seems to be this real kind of push of how you're able to solve your problems, critical thinking skills. Same thing with acuity interest, although less so much. I looked up a claims administrator. They're really big into good written and verbal communication skills. That was really emphasized throughout all of their applications, or all of their positions. And you'll see your critical thinking, uh, good written and verbal communication skills are, are essential to that. And then we have, of course, Boston Consulting Group. They also really, actually I looked at their whole thing, I was like, wow, whoever works here must be really interesting. All of like unflappable and thick yeah. skin <laughs> with the personal fortitude to push back when necessary. I've actually never read that. And I was like, wow, like, who works here, right? <laughs> I don't know see who works at this place. But they really do seem to push for this ability to solve your problems, push back, have a perspective, be a good critical thinker. So it seems to me that universities not necessarily are pushing critical thinking, but definitely employers. Employers you know, really have it in, in their interest to have good critical thinkers as their employees. Okay, so the next thing I had to ask myself is, what is critical thinking? So do any of you have an idea of what critical thinking is? Like, what is critical thinking? Thinking critically? Not really. I, uh, I was kind of actually, so I was waiting for their theoretical definition, which they actually didn't provide. So that kind of bumped me out. So I went to a dictionary, because that's just what I do. Um, <laughs> and I actually just went to Google. And I asked, what is critical thinking? And the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. So an objective analysis, evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. It seems like you're making good, reasonable decisions. Can you take out a perspective? From, can you take out an issue from multiple perspectives? Can you be objective? Um, I also looked at the Council for Aid to Education because they sponsored the CLA. I looked at their definition. They actually had several, three were the primary um, uh, definitions for critical thinking. One was analysis of data. Can you analyze data correctly? Second was writing effectiveness. Can you write effectively? And then can you write clearly? That was their big definition for critical thinking. It actually involved writing, which was interesting to me. I then found out how we operationalized critical thinking in the book, and I found that on page 35 there. 
of the measure is based on how well the student assesses the quality and relevance of evidence, analyzes and synthesizes data and information, draws conclusions from his or her analysis, and considers alternative perspectives. So if somebody presents to you a problem, do you immediately kind of go like, oh, I would do this? Or do you consider multiple perspectives, multiple um, information sources? Can you think to yourself, oh, would that be the right answer for this person and this person? And then can you communicate that answer clearly and effectively? That's supposed to be a good sign of critical thinking. So kind of break it down, evaluate, analyze, and draw logical conclusions. That is basically the essence of critical thinking. Any questions on that, or how they, at least how they operationalize it? Okay, so I bet I'm glad I actually found the CLA, although you have to pay for it if you want to get the full experience, which is too much for me. <laughs> so I went and looked through all of the resources, and I found an example question with CLA. Now, if you were at a university, you probably have been advertised at least some, at some point to take the CLA. The CLA. So this was a big question, it was one of their example questions. Um, the city of Springfield is deciding whether to implement a tax on junk food. Some citizens of Springfield believe that junk food is the cause of the obesity epidemic in their city. Others believe that individuals have the right to consume whatever foods they choose, and citizens should not be taxed for purchasing foods that are high in fat, sugar, or sodium. The representatives at Springfield Senate are deciding whether to implement this tax. tax. As an intern, so you're an intern for one of the senators, you have been asked to write a memo that addresses whether the Springfield Senate should implement the junk food tax. Right? Draw evidence from the following documents. An abstract from the study reporting the relationship between obesity and junk food. A political cartoon depicting how taxing junk food affects the underprivileged. A post from a blog supporting healthy eating. And a letter to the editor discussing the rights of taxing citizens. Now, how would you answer this question? Just given this. Now, I didn't have to give you the abstract of the political cartoon. Would, would you weigh some of the information more critically or at least more importantly than others? You think so? Some of you are nodding your head like, yes, I might pay attention to the abstract more. How about the cartoon? Would you really pay a lot of attention to that? You would, absolutely. The cartoon would be the first thing you would talk about. Excellent. <laughs> How about the letter to the editor or a blog? Maybe. So some of you are kind of judging how important some of that information is. The whole point of the CLA is you would get one of these questions, and then you'd actually have to write out what you would tell the senator. Does that make sense? OK. Now, some of my pros and concerns, or at least cons, of why I see the CLA. So first of all, just looking at that one example question, I really like how it avoids self-report. Uh, a lot of social psychologists like to just ask students, oh, how satisfied are you with your college education? Or do you think your college values critical thinking? And then you like, would say on a one to five scale, kind of a self-report measure. But this measure is a direct measure. It's saying, OK, do you actually think critically? We're going to test that ability for you. So that's a nice direct measure. I applaud that. I applaud that there's two parts to it. Um, there's a make or break argument and a performance task. Um, the essay itself is scored by a computer software program, while the performance task is scored by highly trained people. That kind of concerned me. I felt like the testing should have been all just standardized, or the, at least the examination part should be all just, um, standardized. The problems are based on real problems that actually employers have suggested to the team. So actually, employers have constructed this exam. Like people from Google and Google Interest are actually all part of like, this would be some problems we would want answered for us, which I thought was fascinating. Here are some of my concerns, though. The trained people kind of concern me because although a lot of tests are, are actually being graded by trained people, and they have pretty good high inter-rated reliability, meaning that the people, the scorers, tend to creep quite a bit. I felt like it just should be more standardized in terms of just having a computer program do it. And I think that's well within the means and able to do that. Um, they also have limited volunteers who participate. I know the students who actually take the CLA are being paid, and they actually have time to take this exam, which says a lot of things to me. It says the students who don't have a lot of time are probably not taking this exam. And maybe students who don't have a lot of time are actually showing the greatest improvements in their critical thinking skills. And not only that, um, you're getting paid for it. So you're, all, you're obviously appealing to a demographic that would be like, oh, great, 20 bucks. I could totally use that. Yeah, I'm going to take the CLA. So to me, there's a little bit of a selection bias going on. Um, also, there are real problems presented in an artificial testing situation. I felt like they were kind of testing MacGyver abilities. Like, OK, we're going to lock you in a room. 
and you have to figure out what they're going to get taxed. Here's an abstract and cartoon, figure it out. You know, and I'm like, okay, that's, yeah, but in the real world, I feel like there's a little more going on than just having that source of information. Although I think it's great that they're, they're testing disability, I feel like in the real world, there's a lot more going on when you have to make a decision, right, than just that. Um, students are also told there's no answer that is wrong. And I feel like that's wrong, because they will dock you points if you have bad answers. They will be like, wow, that was stupid, and there's negative five points. And so they will dock you off uh, on points that they think are, are, are inaccurate. And I think that's really wrong to actually tell students, hey, there's no wrong answers. Because many of them could be just like, oh, OK, well, then I'm going to write whatever. Um, but if they actually think, oh, something's on the line, I better actually think about it, they might actually try a little harder. So I think there, that was some issues I had with the CLA itself. Okay, next, I want to go through their second argument. And at any time, if you want to kind of go, oh, how about this and what about that, feel free to ask me or comment. Uh, secondary education and universities are not preparing students to be critical thinkers. So are we not preparing students to be critical thinkers? That's kind of the big push here. First of all, students uh, graduate college not knowing how to write clearly, think critically, or communicate effectively in their jobs. That's a real big push in the book. They're not thinking critically. A lot of times employers argue and complain that, hey, we have students that just can't tell me what's going on, that can't communicate effectively what they need. We don't have that. That's necessary. Also, undergrads only spend 13 hours per week on average studying or preparing for their classes. That's ridiculous. Only 13 hours. Now think to yourself, how often are you preparing each week for your classes? Are you preparing for your, are you preparing at all for your classes? Is 13 like generous? Okay, so 13 <laughs> hours. Now when you think about the national standard states that you should be preparing two to three hours every week per credit hour. Two to three hours every credit hour. That means if you're taking a full load, 12 hours, you should be spending 24 to 36 hours per week studying. Are any of you actually doing that? 24 to 36? There's not one person. <laughs> You're like me, yeah. <laughs> Good, excellent. So there's one person that's in that standard, okay? The, the third thing that they state is that professors are driven to and currently value their research work more than the quality of their teaching and class preparation. So there seems to be like this emphasis that faculty are being rewarded for doing research and they care about their research more than their students. I had a bit of a gripe with this because I felt like there was this um, exclusivity that somehow if you're focusing on research you don't care about your teaching like somehow they're two completely separate things but in reality some of the best researchers I had in college were great um, re were great teachers so the best researchers happen to also be the great teachers some of the greatest teachers I ever had um, that being said I also knew a lot of great teachers who didn't emphasize research so I felt like the relationship they were drawing between the two as being exclusive I thought was a bit erroneous and needed more uh, information to be documented the next thing they say in chapter one is you need a systematic longitudinal research on the assessment of critical thinking and reasoning. So they actually do that. The rest of the book is actually their longitudinal research. So what did they do? They administer the CLA, so that whole exam, to 24 community colleges, colleges, and universities. <coughs> they assess the first two years of college, incoming freshmen and sophomore at the, at, at the end of the sophomore year, 2005 to 2007. Um, they had an N of 2,322, but they had a pretty high attrition rate, about 50% of people dropped out. On average, students increased on the CLA by 0.18 standard deviations. So not even a full standard deviation. Remember how I put you on that normal distribution, and you like were in the middle, and you thought, oh, I'd be way out here right when I graduate? No. no. So in reality, you are here, and in your sophomore year, you are here, <laughs> and then in your senior year, you are here, OK? Mm. So there's not much of a point. It's out. Is that worth all the loan debt you have? You might be like, oh my gosh, no. OK, so let's talk about some of the factors that are contributing to your ability to think more critically. Hey, the, the three big ones they push in chapter two is parental education, race, and class. Parental education, race, and class. Uh, so first, let's look at parental education. So down here we have on the x-axis, uh, and this is actually father's education, I found out. And so mothers are really noted here. So this is father's education. So if your father had a graduate education, for example, over here, versus high school education, then you'd be over here. And this is your 2005 score in the light gray. And then in the dark bars, we have your 2007 scores. 
It turns out if your father is graduate educated, you're going to have higher CLA scores to begin with. And you're also going to have a much better gain, it seems. While if, you're, if your father's only high school educated, you're much, you're much more, less likely to have. You're much more likely to have lower CLA scores. <coughs> Parental education seems to actually affect your critical thinking right away. Okay. Questions on that? Okay, now we're going to move on to race. And this shouldn't be too surprising. Like a lot of standardized tests I see, whites are really performing quite well. So, and then Asians and Hispanics, not too bad. But you notice they have the highest CLA scores, critical thinking scores. And then over here, African Americans or blacks tend to have the lowest. Okay. Any idea why that might be? They posit some ideas in the book. But any idea why blacks are underperforming? Money. Money? Lower money? Let's see. Lower SES. So we both were saying the same thing. Socioeconomic status, less money. So you have less money, less privileges, less ability to find higher education, less ability to buy all those books that, like when I went to school, we were still talking about the USSR. And I was like, that can't be right. <laughs> uh, so, so if you have more money, you're able to get those updated that, textbooks, more information, all, and so forth. So that's really pretty. They do talk about that. Unfortunately, they actually never measure income, which I thought was interesting in, in the CLA. Uh, although they do allude to social economic status being a part of it. The last thing is being middle class. Uh, middle class families, I don't know if you notice, middle and upper class families with more education are accustomed to monitoring and amending the educational system to help achieve their goals. And I actually thought about this for a while, and it's true. If you think about it, middle class and upper class people, um, when they're told, hey, you know, your kid's not performing very well, they're like, really? OK, well, I'm going to come every day to the class and see if I can help. All right? And they're going to really kind of push themselves in there. Well, somebody from a less ad, um, advantaged population or class, maybe a poorer class, all right, they're just trying to make ends meet. Maybe they're working three jobs. They're like, oh, my kid's performing not very well. Oh, OK, oh, well, well, I have to go to my third job now. Um, then we're not going to have time to really intervene. So when you think about class, it can really have an effect on your education <coughs> and how well you can be educated. Now, the third chapter talks about more um, factors that can affect your critical thinking. Uh, and these being selectivity of the school, reading and writing requirements, college expectations, and meeting with faculty and your major. All of those can affect critical thinking. So first, let's talk about the reading and writing requirements. I'm just going to ask you guys, how many of you have a, a reading and writing requirement that's at least 20 pages of writing in that semester and 40 or plus pages of reading per week? How many of you have that? 40 plus pages per week. So less than half of you have raised your hands. Okay, that's all of that, interestingly enough. Okay, <laughs> you have that requirement. So you have no class that is, so some of you have no classes in which any of you are required to at least write 20 pages or read 40 plus. Now when you think about critical thinking and what the critical thinking exam is measuring, critical thinking assessment exam is measuring, be able to, to write effectively and speak of that or communicate effectively, it takes practice. You should be doing a lot of writing and reading in order to know how to actually do what you're to write effectively. So does that seem to affect in any way, um, for example, your CLA scores? So down here we have your x-axis, and this is just a percentage of students who uh, are, uh, depending on their selectivity of their school, have these requirements. <coughs> so here's a course with more than 20 pages of writing, course with more than 40 pages of reading, neither course requirement or having both. What I find really interesting is if you look at the dark, dark bars, the like black bars, the highly selective schools, so those like Harvard and Yale and Stanford and so forth, they are definitely requiring more of that of their students. Okay? More students are, are having those requirements. The less selective and the selective schools for sure are not requiring that type of level of achievement in their classes. So if you're going to a higher level school, you're expected to perform higher, right, at a higher ability. Now, also culture, what you're expecting from your school. So education is seen as a necess is necessary for getting a better paying job. Most people assume, OK, I have to go to college in order to get a better paying job. The second thing is, though, is that students and parents are approaching education a lot like consumerism, like in a, in a consumerist approach. So they're, they're thinking of going to college almost like going to Target or Walmart and buying something. Can you just buy your education? Can you amend it according to how you want it? 
And that has led to a lot more people majoring in what's called the practical arts. So they call this business, <coughs> education, social work, communication, health, computer science, and engineering as practical arts. I also call those trades. I don't know if that's out of vogue. But they're kind of considered trades, in my opinion. Also, if you major in all of those fields, you're much more likely to have higher paying jobs right, as you start off when you graduate. Does that affect your critical thinking? So I have to ask, do you think people in business have a lot of critical thinking or have high critical thinking skills? These are people who are going to go and they're going to graduate and they're going to start a business, make decisions like kind of tax people. Are they going to have high critical? You think so? I heard like a big fat yes in the back there. They should really have high. Well, let's see. That's fine. <laughs> so you go forward and go first. Let's. I, I, I get that one next. But here we have um, business, education, social work, engineering, communications, health, humanities, social sciences, and and science and math. And then we have down here what's expected from these majors. So we have on the x-axis whether or not uh, they have 20 pages or more of writing, 40 more pages of reading, neither and both. And as you notice, what major seems to have the most, or at least the highest requirements? It's definitely humanities and social sciences. Humanities and social sciences really pushes that you're at least writing and reading the, the 40 pages uh, and 20 some for writing. The least amount you'll notice here is uh, engineering and computer science. Right? And then, of course, coming in is business and social work as next. Business and social work has the lowest requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next thing, because I'm going to also point out how it affects your critical thinking here in a minute, is how you live, or where you live, and how you work. Can that all affect your critical thinking, of course, your scores? It turns out 70% of students are living on campus. Is that true for most of you? Are most of you living on campus? Yeah, I've seen Hawaii, that's quite different. 65% of students on average are working on or off campus. How many of you are working at least on or off campus? Actually, that's a much higher degree here. So at least uh, 80 to 90% of students are significantly different. Also, black students tend to work more hours than any other racial group, at least in their finding. So black students are working more um, than other students, and also they also they have a higher report of living off campus. So if you notice here, all of those might would affect your CLA. Students who live on campus tend to have higher CLA scores. Students who are working have higher CLA scores as well, and of course, um, being black it tends to disadvantage you for all your CLA scores as well. Oh, next, so let's talk about faculty expectations time spent studying, and the type of studying that you do and how that can affect your CLA scores. First, um, do you feel like you're being challenged? I have to just ask in general at, at your school. Do you feel like you're being challenged in your classes? Some of you emphasize that emphatic yes. You're all looking at Yeshima. Did you say yes? Right? Some of you are shaking your heads otherwise, which is really interesting. Do you think that would affect how much, how much work you put into your, how much effort you put into your work? Yes, no, pretty great. So it turns out that definitely does seem to have some sort of effect. First of all, faculty expectations in your CLA scores. It turns out that when uh, students feel like there's high expectations, on average they tend to have higher CLA scores than students who feel like their faculty have low expectations of them. Interestingly enough, the reading and writing requirements, students who feel like they have both the reading and writing requirements, they often will have higher CLA scores than hmm. students who had neither or just one or the other. Okay? So having high expectations and high requirements seems to create, or at least be associated with, higher CLA scores. The next is how much time you're spending studying. So I have to just ask you guys, how much time do you think you spend socializing on a total week, in a seven day week? 50% of your time, 40% of your time, 80% of your time, 10%, how many of you would be like 10%, 20%? Oh, okay, so good amount of you. 50%, any of you 50%? Wow, okay, interesting. Some of you are like 60, 70, 80, that's all I'm doing. Okay, how many, oh, I sleep, I'm still socializing, I'm imagining, okay. I'm of socializing, that's okay. So we have here what students are actually doing in uh, college. It turns out you're spending about 10% of your time during the week attending your class, which is about average, but you're only spending 7% of your time studying. Now, if you're actually spending the 24 to 36 hours a week, you should be studying. This should be about 25% of your 20 to 25 percent of your time. Okay? The rest is done working, volunteering, and then of course a good amount of sleeping, which I'm like, yes, I missed that. <laughs> and then there's the 
percent is socializing and recreating an other. And I was really shocked to see that. That the students who are taking the CLA spend so much time socializing. That really quite shocked me. So they're spending that much time doing that. Now, that being said, that's studying. Do you think studying could affect your critical thinking abilities? Absolutely. How many of you study in groups? Any of you study in groups? Okay, how many of you study alone most of the time? Okay, okay, interesting. Do you think those who study in groups have higher CLA or those who study alone? What do you think? Alone? Great. Right. Why, why is that, you think? Exactly. So every time I ever, so I was an undergrad and like the 10 times I socialized, well, because I was a little introvert. Um, and I was married, so that was really hard. Anyway, so I'd go out and I'd study in groups and we'd get together and I'd be like, great, we're gonna study, excellent. We'd spend the next hour just gossiping. And I'd just be like, oh my God. And like three hours would go by, I'm like, we haven't even cracked open the book yet. So we haven't actually done any studying. So I, I, I realized, okay, if I'm gonna study, I'm gonna have to do this alone. It turns out this is true for critical thinking scores. So the solid line here is studying alone. The more light, the more you study alone, more hours you study alone, the higher your critical thinking skills, or at least at least according to CLA, tend to be. While if you're studying in groups or just spending time in a fraternity, I like how they equate the two, um, the lower your critical thinking skills will be. Okay, so think about that the next time your peers ask you to study together, you're like, but my critical thinking skills. <laughs> <laughs> at least they're associated with that. Okay. Now, I had to scan this from the book. I apologize that it's not that great. But uh, overall, the whole book talks about how all of these factors, all of these factors, can predict critical thinking skill, your, your critical thinking score. So you look here at uh, factors prior to college, um, your parental education, your race, a little bit of your gender, whether or not you attend a non-white high school. Now, I know this might sound odd, but yes, attending a non-white high school, and that's defined as any high school that has less than 70% of its, or 70% or more of its people being non-white, you're likely to have lower CLA scores, right? Um, also, academic preparation, AP classes, SATs, uh, uh, ACTs will all affect your critical thinking. And then, of course, uh, time spent alone, studying, field of study, all of that will affect your CLA scores. Now, what I found most interesting about this is that it only explained about 42% of the variance. So if you're in my stats courses or my other courses, you should know that's not even 50% of the variance that's being accounted for. So although this is a pretty good amount of variance, that's not an overwhelming majority of the variance. So yes, I would say that these factors are definitely associated with critical thinking, but to think that they can definitely predict your critical thinking, it would be an overstatement. Um, the last chapter is really about a mandate for reform. So the last chapter is saying, look, we need more moral or cultural education in our universities. We need to be emphasizing less socialization and teaching our students how to be good students. Right? The next thing is we need to standardize college teaching. Too many times, I don't know how many of you have ever had a TA be your teacher, many of you probably don't, but when I was a graduate student, uh, we had one class that taught us how to be a TA, but there wasn't a lot of formal training for how to be a teacher. And I can also resonate with this. As a graduate student, there was kind of this de-emphasis on teaching, or at least this, uh, this minimizing teaching and, and more emphasizing research. There's also this big push of undergraduate teaching should be the priority of universities and not research, which I thought was fascinating, that we should be really pushing for more teaching and less research. I didn't necessarily agree, though, that teaching and research cannot work together. I thought that was a big misconception of the book. And then they also think you should report student outcomes publicly, that universities should, be, should become now accountable to the government on how much other students are actually learning in their classes, uh, which also then, of course, emphasize that they should be learned using the CLA to, as their outcome measure. Um, the last two things I want to mention that I thought the book didn't really talk about, which uh, from a social side perspective, this is what I'm thinking about. Um, first of all, is raising children with values emphasizing the love of learning and education. I really thought that a lot of the push for, or at least the scores on critical thinking, could be accounted for by the fact that a lot of these students are being raised in an environment, like for example, their fathers are professors, or their fathers are have graduate, graduate education. They're already in an environment from the time of their birth in which education is pushed, and, and learning and the love of learning is pushed. If you're raised in that environment where your city, your, your mother and your father, your, your, the country you live in is all pushing for education, 
I think you're just going to have a higher likelihood of scoring higher on the CLA and, of course, being a better critical thinker in general. I also think they didn't talk about this at all, and I thought this was aptitude in intellectual development. In this country, we're really kind of pushing for everyone getting educated, when the reality is everyone not, might not be ready after high school to go to college. Right? Some people might need a little more time. And, and we have to think, consider that seriously, that some people should maybe go to a trade school instead, or maybe think about going someplace else instead, maybe working for a little bit before they just jump into college and thinking that college is just gonna make them smarter, right, and consume it that way. And I think we have to consider that seriously if we're gonna think, okay, if someone's gonna college educate, they're gonna be already smarter as it is. Um, the last thing, and I told you guys, is that by using the CLA, you're gonna, it, it's kind of a product push. Basically, the CLA is being product push. And I went to their website, and I, and I had to just look more and more. And they're now providing students with badges. So that if you take the CLA, you can get a badge and show this to your employer and say, yeah, look, I'm a good critical thinker now. I have scored advanced on the wow. CLA. So that you can now pre present your resume and your CLA score to them. And they'll be like, oh, OK, this is great. Um, which I really thought that was a big kind of product push, and I really did enjoy that. But I, I do understand where they're coming from to some extent, that you do need some measure. OK, so some general conclusions. The CLA is a decent measure of critical thinking. I did think it was a decent measure of looking at, um, I didn't get to see all of it, but I did see the examples I saw. I thought it was a pretty decent measure. The model explains almost half of the variance, but not all of the variance in critical thinking. So we, we should really um, at least emphasize that more research should be done with the CLA in order to find out if these factors are really affecting CLA as we think they are. And the U.S. emphasizes consumerism and minimizes uh, intellectualism and academic preparedness. I think if you want to see a general kind of overturn a lot of critical thinking and the effectiveness of college and education, there has to be also a kind of a cultural shift that goes in valuing education more. Okay, so thank you. I want to thank Dr. Shishima for putting this all together. Psychi and Psych Club also as well, and all of you for listening. I really appreciate that. Okay, gang, uh, we have time for uh, questions, comments. Um, boy, a lot, a lot of stuff packed into this uh, 45 minutes. So comments, reactions to what was discussed, presented. Yeah, I think that even if you're research and teaching, like, why are they so separate? Like, why can't you just do one thing Well, a lot of work goes into doing research. You have to spend a lot of time, I, and, I, and I understand this to some extent, you have to spend a lot of time alone, a lot of time writing, a lot of time just doing other things. Um, and so, so if that so much time is spent doing that research, it's hard to prepare for your class, prepare, prepare for a good lecture. So they're seeing them as very antithetical. But the reality is, is that most of the time, like especially the teachers I met that were also good researchers, so good teachers and good researchers, they tend to kind of put those two together. So oftentimes their classes was about their research. So they would combine those things. And I think the students who really benefited from that uh, were, were also students who uh, to be honest with you, we're like, we're already read the material before they came to class so we can talk about other stuff that's kind of more cutting edge or uh, on the edge or, am I seeing that right? Cutting edge? Is that a term? Yes. Thank you. So cutting edge. So things that were more happening in the now. So it, but I can see an, an, as an undergrad, a lot of students might not be prepared for that. I see a lot of times undergrad students come and all, they barely even read the book. So I have to do a lot more overview before I can talk about the newer stuff. Back then. So all of their students had, were an average age of about uh, 19 something, 19. So their average age was 19. So they didn't actually use age as a predictor, although they did have one. They did have that variable in there for the their last mile. 